Chapter 8 How to Fix Stuff Every man knows that to truly be a man, you must know how to make home repairs to the satisfaction of your spouse or significant other, or at least act like you can. Back in the day, who thought this ridiculous statement up, they should be hunted down and beaten. Back before the onset of the computer and electronics age, a man was pretty comfortable with repairs of the household and the associated equipment. We could all become the handyman just by taking things apart and seeing how they worked. There may have been several extra parts left over when the item was reassembled, but that is how we got our experience and wisdom. We could usually tell where the extra parts went when we turned the appliance on and it didn't work or acted in a strange manner. Repairs, like replacing the belt on a washing machine that turned the drum, it was reassembled and there were a couple of small bolts left over. Surely they couldn't be that important. The newly repaired washer was turned on and worked great until it got to the spin cycle and waltzed its way across the laundry room and tried to escape by beating the back door nearly to splinters. Thankfully, the power cord was only six feet long, and it exceeded the length of the power cord during its attempt to escape and unplugged itself before I had to replace the back door. Aha! Those bolts must belong on the balance bar that attached to the drum, or the washer has been possessed by a demon. Either way, I didn't approach it till it stopped moving, just in case. See, it all comes down to experience. It turns out it was a mechanical problem and not a religious one, which is a good thing because nobody I knew could perform an exorcism on a washer. Those were the days when almost every 16-year-old boy knew how to change the oil, check fluid levels, and all kinds of maintenance items on the family car and their own vehicle as well. Often, it was the hard lesson we had to learn to perform these maintenance repairs on a frequent basis. Things like verifying the gasket from the old oil filter was not stuck to the filter mount, otherwise the oil would all run out onto the driveway when the car was started. Always open the radiator slowly so you didn't scald yourself, the dog, and everyone else that may be within 20 feet radius of the car. Again, having to clean the driveway. Old Faithful isn't as impressive as a hot radiator. We didn't have the EPA back then, but we did have Dad, and he didn't want anything that would kill his grass on the lawn left on the driveway. Green grass was a hard-fought and expensive battle in the desert of West Texas. Speaking of lawn maintenance, there were always things to fix for the yard. The old lawn mowers didn't have the fancy gadgets and self-propelled features on them. You literally had to push them yourself and perform the maintenance unless you wanted to push the lawnmower, real mower, that didn't have a gas engine. These little jewels weighed about 50 pounds and had the curly cube blades that spun when the wheels of the lawnmower turned. You better sharpen the blades unless you wanted to spend most of the day in 100 degree weather shoving this thing around the front and the backyard. You learned quickly how to operate a half-round file to sharpen blades. We didn't have the little electric grinders they have now. Filing those blades till they were sharp enough to shave with was another chore you learned to do quickly and efficiently. The day just keeps getting hotter, and we had to drink out of the water hose. The water in West Texas was already nasty, and combining the nasty with the taste of the plastic water hose with water at a temperature of just under boiling was an experience to remember. Now... If you were lucky enough to own a gas engine-powered lawnmower, you learned quickly about maintaining and repairing them. They were actually pretty simple to keep in operational shape, and the most frequent problem was running out of gas. Always have a full gas can before you started the mowing project because the alternative was to siphon some gas from Dad's truck. This consisted of getting a short length of water hose usually one that you had run over with a lawnmower while it was rolled up, leaving at least two places that had a hole and leaked. This was the part your dad beat you with after he spliced the bigger sections back together. and was about four feet long. You inserted one end into the fill spout on the truck until it reached the bottom of the tank and sucked on the other end to make sure you were in the liquid. 
You lowered the other end so it was below the truck's fill spout and got your gas can ready so you could shove it into the gas can immediately when the gasoline started coming out. You then had to suck the gasoline up the hose till it reached a point where the downhill flow set up a siphoning effect and would pull the gasoline up the hose without you having to suck on the hose. You always knew it when it was getting close and were prepared to take the hose out of your mouth before the gas filled your mouth. If you were not quick enough, the gasoline filled your mouth and you would lock everything down trying to keep from swallowing it, which forced the gasoline out your nostrils. I have heard folks these days talk about laughing and having coffee or tea or orange juice or some other beverage come out their nose. Yeah, ain't nothing compared to having gasoline come out your nostrils. It burns, and it isn't even on fire. If it is, you got bigger problems. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention to always make sure no one around you is smoking especially Mr. Smith, who lives across the street and is an expert to hear him tell it on everything. Not just a jack-of-all-trades and master of none, but a real live expert who will spew his knowledge whether asked or not. He always had a lit camel clenched between his fingers while spewing his words of wisdom. His favorite preliminary speech was, I've been doing this for 60 years so I can tell you the best way to... He got mad at me for saying, doing it for 60 years doesn't mean you're good. It just means you're old. He went and told my dad. Okay, so we have plenty of gas and we're ready to start this thing. You close the choke. If you don't know what a choke is, I'm not going to tell you. You just have to figure it out on your own. And grip the pull cord with your strong right hand and yank it with all your might. Those lawnmowers didn't usually start on the first pull, or even the second for that matter. You usually had to pull on it enough to get the engine to pull some of the gas up from the tank, hence the choke. You had to be careful not to flood the carburetor because then you had to wait for some of the gasoline to vaporize out of the cylinders. If that didn't work, you pulled the spark plug and checked it for carbon or other material that could cause it to foul. If need be, you cleaned the spark plug electrode and dried the gasoline off it. Here we are, still pulling on the pull cord and the lawnmower trying to get it started. If you're a newbie, your dad will come out and help you get it started. You tell him all the things you have done so far and he ponders a moment and says, I wonder if the ignition coil is bad. You pull the spark plug wire off and hold the little metal end. I will pull on the pull rope and tell me if you feel a tingle. This is where you get your experience in lawnmower maintenance. If you suspect the ignition coil has gone bad, which they never do, you throw that lawnmower away and get the real mower out and use it. I did as instructed and pulled the spark plug wire off, dutifully held the little metal tip that clips it to the spark plug, and watched Dad with an evil grin on his face reach down and grab the pull rope and give it a yank. You learn that the ignition coil on a lawnmower produces enough electrical current to power a small town, somewhere around 11 kazillion volts, and you are holding on to the little metal clip that transfers this current to yourself. I peed my pants a little, farted, learned three new curse words, and forgot my name for about 30 minutes. Oh, and bit my tongue. Dad and Mr. Smith across the street were rolling on the ground laughing. This was hilarious to them and an unforgettable lesson for me. I later discussed this with several of the kids in the neighborhood and found out they had all fallen for this same prank. Once. It must have been a dad thing. A ritual performed on all sons coming of age to take over the lawn chores. My older brother also thought it was hilarious and said that he had been introduced to the lawnmower coil a year earlier. Like a good father, I passed the knowledge and the experience on to my son. Speaking of my older brother, he has a way with errant lawnmowers. I went to visit him one particular Sunday after we were both grown and had started our families, and when I pulled up in front of his house, he was trying to get his lawnmower to start. I sat in my truck with the air conditioner blowing and watched as he vigorously pulled the starter rope about a dozen times with no satisfactory result. 
The last time he pulled it, he did not release it, but jerked the whole lawnmower up over his head and swung it around about four to five times and launched the whole thing out into the street. My older brother is a fairly large ex-Marine that don't put up with no crap from any lawnmower. He advanced on the misbehaving lawnmower, exclaiming that, I bet you start now, you son of a bitch, reached down and pulled the starter rope and it fired to life. I truly believe the lawnmower was terrified to not start. The wheels were a little wobbly, but it performed admirably after that. Electrical repairs were usually left to a professional, especially after two or three attempts resulted in a fire. Learning to tap dance by touching a live 120-volt wire, I firmly believe this is where breakdancing was invented. A fire, blowing a circuit breaker completely out of the breaker box. A fire, having an appliance take flight. A kitchen mixer has a comical way of levitating when it's wired to 220 volts, by the way. Or a fire. Once you realize you got the same result from touching a live wire as you did from the spark plug wire previously mentioned, you pretty much got broke a sucking eggs. That's West Texas for never do that again. The difference being that 120 volts AC will kill you or leave you with a permanent stutter instead of just loading up your britches the way the 12 volt DC systems do. We learn to always turn the power off to whatever electrical device you may be working on. Well, of course, the professionals could work electrical systems while they're still hot. You could tell they were professional electricians by the way they constantly drooled, answered the voices only they could hear, or had a severe twitch. I was always amazed at the professional electricians that de-energized a circuit and then slapped the wires with the back of their hand. I asked one why he did that. His answer? If I hit a live wire with the back of my hand, it just shocks me. If I hit it with the front of my hand, it makes my hand close around the live wire and I talk to God and wet myself. It actually took longer for him to answer due to the stutter, but I really can't type a stutter very well. I asked him why he didn't just use the voltage meter to see if the circuit was still hot. He just kind of looked at me like he was trying to process a complicated math problem, and I swear there were little tendrils of smoke coming out his ears. At this point, I concluded that this professional had been cooked past well done. Hmm. Okay, Bubba, wipe the drool off your chin. You're dripping on Mama's carpet. Electrical repair can be learned if you pay attention and understand that making mistakes can give the word smoking a whole new meaning. Every real man has attempted to install the beloved ceiling fan that his spouse insists will enhance the ambiance of a given bedroom. And there are so many things to remember when trying to install this wondrous product. Where to get the electrical supply is primary. You learn quickly to splice into a circuit that does not affect the master bedroom. If this circuit is overloaded, the most important electrical device in the house, the bathroom exhaust fan, is affected. Plus, your wife gets unhappy when she overloads the circuit with her hair blow dryer and it trips the circuit breaker. Next, most important is supporting the ceiling fan. It is historically recorded that your common bedroom sheetrock will not support anything that weighs more than a small kitten. This becomes evident the first time the fan is energized and it rips a four-foot square section of the weak sheetrock from the bedroom ceiling. You have to install wooden supports that spread the weight and distribute it to the stronger elements. This may be an engineering term, but it makes a lot of sense. The next important item to consider is the elevation of the finished installation of a ceiling fan. If the fan is positioned too low, it'll effectively trim the hair or scalp of the person that forgets to duck under the fan blades, not to mention they will have so many knots on their head. They resemble a Klingon on a Star Trek movie. Not all home repairs entail difficult items. Many are as simple as the wife breaking a plate or a vase or some other item that cannot be replaced or that has sentimental value. They will give the pieces to you and, with pouty eyes, ask, Can you glue this back together? A real man's response will always be, Well, sure, darling, anything for you. Knowing full well that gluing things back to their original condition is impossible. 
it is a universal law that once something brittle is broken, the pieces will instantly grow little nubbins that prevent the pieces from being put back together in their original position. There will also be itty-bitty shards of the glass or ceramic that are missing and that the little woman has dutifully swept up and deposited into the trash. The lesson to be learned here is that more glue isn't better. You should always use the minimum amount of glue for any situation. Another law of the universe will become apparent. Glue will not stick and harden on the pieces to be glued back together as quickly as it'll stick and dry on your fingers or the kitchen linoleum countertop you used as a workbench. You'll also find that the finished repair will appear like a Van Gogh art piece that is permanently adhered to two fingers on one of your hands and the linoleum countertop. You dutifully present the finished product to your wife, complete with a couple of layers of skin from your fingers and a chunk of linoleum from the countertop. Now, you have to replace the countertop that is missing a chunk right in the middle so that it can't be hidden. You usually discover that you evidently got some glue on your shirt and have permanently adhered your shirt to your belly. You further learn that the glue and adhesive remover you bought doesn't actually remove dried glue, but it does blister the skin at the edges of the glue that is torn off when you decide to rip the shirt off your belly. The healing process from home repairs can be long and painful. As we got older, the more complicated auto repairs and maintenance also became our duty. Again, back before the advent of the electronic age, men had to perform a not uncomplicated auto maintenance item called changing the points and plugs. The distributor on these older vehicles performs two related tasks. The first uses a simple on-off switch, the ignition points, to provide properly timed pulses of 12-volt electricity to the ignition coil. In the coil, essentially a transformer, it's stepped up to 10,000 to 20,000 volts. Then, the high-voltage electricity from the coil returns to the distributor where the rotor inside parcels it out to the correct spark plug to ignite the fuel and air mix. There's a lobed cam on the distributor shaft that pushes on a small rubbin block on the movable side of the points. As the cam and distributor rotate, the points open and close constantly. As they close, current from the ignition switch flows through the contacts into the coil's primary windings and then off to the ground. This current generates a magnetic field in the coil's iron core. When the points open a few degrees of crankshaft rotation later, the current is interrupted, causing the magnetic field to collapse. This induces electrical current into the secondary windings of the coil, where the current is raised to 20,000 volts or more. The high voltage now travels over to the distributor, where the rotor meets the high voltage pulses out to the correct spark plug. All that current flowing across the points doesn't like to stop suddenly and can initiate a small arc, which eventually erodes the tungsten contacts. The condenser cushions that arc, making point life much longer, but not infinitely long. As the contacts and the plastic rubbing block, which contacts the point cam, wear, the ignition points clearance and timing constantly change. After thousands of miles, the timing has shifted enough to affect performance, and the ritual of changing the points and setting the timing becomes necessary. If this is not performed correctly, the gas-air mixture is released to the exhaust system and can be ignited from the exhaust of the spark plug that next discharges, causing an explosion in the exhaust system called a backfire. This is about the time you notice that the exhaust system needs maintenance and has rusted the connection from the exhaust pipe to the muffler. The oxidation or rusting concentrates on the weak point, so the explosive backfire has effectively blown the connection off the tailpipe to the muffler, completely negating the muffler. Now, your vehicle sounds like a Mexico City taxi cab. The very young think this makes the vehicle sound tough. The rest of us feel... We are violating a city noise ordinance and disturbing the wildlife. This necessitates replacement of the entire exhaust and muffling system. 
Thankfully, this is a job for a muffler shop, and we breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not sure if you have picked up on the way some repairs will cause additional repairs. It's similar to the chapter in the Bible. Adam begat Seth, Cush begat Nimrod, Canaan begat Sidon, etc. There is a lot of begetting in home maintenance and repair. You can see from this story how one thing will lead to another. Washing machine begat replacement of back door. Lawnmower repair begat mistrust of your dad. Ceiling fan begat drywall replacement. Home repairs begat learning new curse words. You see how everything is linked? Your spouse picks up on this linkage, though she usually doesn't point it out till you are about five years into the marriage. Wives used to have so much confidence in their hubby that no repair was too difficult for their man. And in an effort to keep the facade alive, we husbands would always spout some stupid comment like, you bet, darling, I can fix anything. A man will start noticing that their wife will start delegating home repairs and maintenance to professionals that specialize in the various specific repairs. You will start seeing appliance repairmen, electricians, painters, etc., and if you ask about it, they will give you little white lies like, you're so tired when you come home from work, I didn't want you to have to bother with it, or you deserve a weekend without having to work on that, here's a beer. It is here where you discover that raving about the $50 repair bill for the clothes dryer is best kept to yourself. If you let your masculinity take over and point the cost out to your wife, she will most certainly point out that the $80 ceiling fan ended up costing $650 to install after the replacement of the wiring, ceiling sheetrock, and the destruction of her freshly completed hairdo, etc., should you continue to mention all the repairs you have completed over the years, you will get your feelings hurt. Wives are a wonderful thing, but don't think for a moment that they are helpless little creatures. If they were put in a combat situation, there'd be no prisoners taken, and the wounded would be bayoneted. <laughs>